Uh, hello, all. Uh, my, my name is Michael Foyer. I'm the Dean of the Rider School of Education and Human Development here at GW. It's a pleasure to welcome you and for us to be together. Um, I want to just say a couple of sentences of introduction. Uh, the title of the documentary that we're going to be talking about and that I hope many of you have had a chance to see is called A Year Interrupted. 2020 high school seniors face COVID-19. Uh, the, the word interrupted is, I think, going to become, as we look back historically on this traumatic year plus that we have endured, as um, maybe one of the more hopeful kind of uh, ways of describing things. Uh, some of us have kidded about how uh, this has been one heck of a gap year. and. Although for many of us, uh, I think the gap has been in in ways more manageable and more endurable and 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 survivable than than for so so many other people. And one of the the truly beautiful and masterful um, aspects of this film is to really bring us up close and personal with a group of people uh, who went through this year and and had to really cope with some incredible combinations of stress and uncertainty uh, in ways that at least I can speak for myself. Uh, I feel very fortunate that I did not have to but I'm also, I consider myself fortunate to have friends and colleagues such as Elizabeth Rich and Brooke Sayas who have been doing this kind of work and bringing it to all of us. Elizabeth is the opinion editor for Education Week. Uh, actually, uh, this is a good example of somebody who needs no introduction being introduced by somebody who takes all the introducing he can get. <laughs> but Education Week, as we all know in this business, is the is is the uh, principal source, the paper of record, the medium of record for everything having to do with elementary and secondary and a little bit post-secondary education uh, in the U.S. and around the world. And Elizabeth has only been with Education Week since 2007 um, and is now the opinion editor. And it, I'll uh, I'll, I'll express my opinion. She's the best damn opinion editor I know, and it's really a wonderful uh, gift that we have to be connected with Elizabeth and with Education Week. And in advance of this conversation, thank you, Elizabeth, uh, for being our colleague, friend, and bringing this to us. Uh, Brooke, I've only known uh, much more recently uh, Brooke Theus is a video journalist and producer at Education Week uh, and comes to this work with <clears throat> training in documentary studies and visual storytelling um, and with a bachelor's degree in gender and women's studies from University of Wisconsin, uh, a distinguished photojournalist and documentarist uh, here in Washington now doing a lot of work with Education Week, but I think also some other stuff uh, on your own. And together they have uh, joined forces to produce this truly uh, remarkable, remarkable film um, that, uh, as I said, uh, watching it, and I know there are other even, um, shall we say, smaller news outlets who are trying out podcasts and things with the word interrupted in it. But so far, based on what I've seen, you guys have it nailed. And this is the best thing I've seen of the genre. So I want to thank you in advance um, uh, for what enlightenment you are both capable of and capable of sharing with so many of us. Uh, we're going to start by having Elizabeth and Brooke uh, give a little bit of an overview. Then I think we're going to show some clips from the film, and then we're going to have an opportunity for some reaction, discussion, and our guests who are with us 
who have uh, logged in as uh, attendees, uh, the usual um, WebEx or Zoom rules apply. Please use the uh, Q&A feature or the chat to send either me or Meg Holland a question or a request to get in on the conversation when we get there. And we'll do our very best to have as much conversation as possible. So with that in advance, thank you again, both of you. Um, I learned how to say that phrase, both of you from watching Judy Woodruff night after night, but I, but I think she still does it better than me. So hello to both of you. Elizabeth Rich, you're up first. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for that really nice introduction. I do hope that my Wi-Fi is not going to go down south while I'm talking. I'm in a remote part of Maryland, so apologies in advance. Um, I will make this brief before we start the showing of the three clips. Um, Brooke and I have just had this unbelievable experience in 2020 of making this film together, which we'll talk about um, obviously in the next hour. The three clips we're going to show really tell the story of the arc of the film and to some extent the arc of our lives in the last year. Um, I think the thing that really makes us happy is that we ended on a very hopeful note for those of you who saw the film. I think you'll agree. Um, the first clip is the moment. So, you know, the, you'll, the film starts basically with school closing. And um, there's a moment for all of us, I think, after the shock of um, the initial wave of COVID sort of passed, where we were all sort of wondering, well, what's next? And that's the first clip that we're going to show, which is this moment that we refer to as ennui. We really didn't know what was happening for any of us. The kids didn't know. The teachers didn't know. The second clip we're going to show is really the moment where everything seemed to coalesce around the national reckoning on racial injustice in this country. Um, the New York Times, according to an analysis they did, described it as the, to the Black Lives Movement was the largest movement in the nation's history. So um, we'll see that. And then the end is just a bit of the hope that these two young people who are just so remarkable display when they finally arrive on their college campuses. So Brooke, I'm going to let you Take it away and show the three clips. They're pretty short, so you won't have to get too antsy while you're watching them. I miss cohort and now that the governor said that we will not be returning to school for the rest of the academic year, you know, it really saddens me. So I'm outside my apartment building, just finished a walk. I had to get out or I was gonna go insane. Do you have your phone and your computer on? I was not expecting this in any way, shape, or form. Nice job with the shirts. <laughs> <laughs> my concern in the back of my mind was what's going to happen with them at home because some of them, their time at school gives them their alone time and they can focus on their themselves and their studies. I'm a person that like literally won't get home till seven or eight because I usually have like track practice and track meets, government meetings. My family is not used to me being at home 24 seven. I'm not used to being at home 24 seven. I never feel like at peace. I'm always doing work in my room. I'm always doing work next to my bed. So when I go on my bed to finally rest, I still feel like the stress of all the work that I have done and all the work I still have to do. So now we're we're working to support and provide instruction without being around them. So it's just a totally different feel to it. Tonight video has surfaced of an African-American man being chased down and killed. His family says he was just out jogging. It really makes you feel like there's no hope in this world. What is in store for us? It's just, it's just been such a wild ride this year. And it honestly, it's just been going downhill since. The officer who was kneeling on his neck had his hand in his pocket like it was nothing. Like it was just another day's work. Any one of us could have been in that same position. When I'm 
I'll tell you all, I told Ms. Bailey before we got on this call that I'm having a really hard day. I've been having a really hard week because I watched that video and I cannot get the him calling for his mother out of my head. It was disgusting and painful to watch. I wish I had not watched it. Wasn't there another incident? Um, someone by the name like Taylor who shot in her own apartment? There are so many, and there are many more that we don't even know about. It just surprised me a lot how people seem to focus on, again, like the aspects of Black culture, and then when it comes to the issue of like Black lives, it's, it's dead, it's dead silent. Being like, treated as an intellectual has definitely given me the confidence to like speak my opinions and not really second guess myself. I feel more comfortable in like my own like skin and like in the world that I'm living in. My dad said that we will make it through these four years. Um, we'll find a way to make, find the money. We'll find a way to graduate. He said that he didn't really get to enjoy my high school graduation, so he's looking forward to my college graduation. Now I'm here, I'm in the same place where people didn't want me here, but I am here, receiving the same education. And nobody can tell me nothing. <laughs> I think you selected three clips that actually do pick up on those segments of the story. And I hope that if people haven't yet had a chance to see the whole thing with good bandwidth, they will find a way to do that soon. And I'm sure they will want to. Uh, let me kick this off with a, with a question a film like this that re is released in December of 2020, you must have started thinking about it months before. And am I correct that when you began the project, you were mostly focused on the pandemic and the school closures and all of that disruption? And at some point, you realized there was at least one other concurrent pandemic that we were being reminded of which is about the racial injustice and the violence. Did that mean that you had to do a kind of artistic pivot in, in the way you had started planning the, the whole sequence of interviews and, and topics? So we, to take a step back, you know, we, I, I had actually started filming a program, the cohort program, which is a, the college access program for students of color for the boys um, back in September of 2019. That was actually the original focus of what was going to be a story about this successful program and, and following a few of those boys um, in their experience of it. Um, and we, uh, you know, we got to the, the winter and we got to March when COVID happened. And I had already built these relationships with um, these, these teachers and these students and catastrophe was happening around us. And I was sort of in this moment of like, well, what, what is going to happen to these students? What is going to happen to these teachers? What is going to happen to the world? What are, I was told I was at a loss. I really didn't know where we were going to go with it. Um, and so I, I can let Elizabeth jump in um, and give a little uh, insight into kind of how she got involved when that happened. So Fiona. Sure. Um, I was actually looking for a district or a school to cover in terms of um, thinking about a college access program and how counselors were managing. And I had picked one in the area. Um, I won't say which one in the DMV area. And um, at the last minute, they turned me down and we had to do a project as we were sort of on the hook for it. And I was 
scrambling to try to figure out what's going on. And at that time we were still in the office and I, Brooke was working downstairs. I was working upstairs. I ran down to her because I could also feel the heat of the pandemic starting up. I mean, I think this was like probably exactly a year ago, you know, within a couple of days. And I ran downstairs to where she was working and I just said, what do you got? <laughs> and we joined forces at that point and just basically decided to tell the story together. She had these relationships. We found the students through the educators, these two that we were gonna focus on. We'd actually had three and then scaled it back to two seniors. And then in terms of your question about, you know, changing the course, I mean, that's a whole other conversation that we could have, but we really were open to whatever was going to happen. And I will say that there was a point where we thought in April, kind of around where you saw Luis, who's the young man say, you know, I wasn't expecting this in any way, shape or form. He's a remarkable young man as is Faith, who's the young woman, where we thought, we're not sure what's going to happen because these kids were deep in the process of planning for college, figuring out money. And then this moment occurred and Brooke was very much involved in sort of tracking them at that point. Well, that's, that's a, a great uh, sort of invitation for me to ask a little bit more about Faith and Luis, because they are on the one hand, so remarkable in their in their authenticity, in their openness, in their expressiveness. Uh, you know, if I didn't know better, I'd say, well, you you did casting calls and you picked the ones who would turn out best on a documentary. I don't think that's the way you, you found them. Say a little bit more about that kind of connection making. Yeah, you know, we didn't have a lot of time. Uh, we had figured this out, I wanna say like, maybe like a couple days before everything shut down. And so I was sort of scrambling and I had reached out to Tim and Wendy um, and they had given me some names and suggested some students that they thought would be um, excited to be a part of this or interested. Um, and I will say without Tim and Wendy's um, recommendation and having her buy in, their buy into this, I don't think the students would have even been comfortable in initially. They 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 had such strong relationships, especially with Wendy, that anything Wendy would have said you should do, they felt like, okay, well, if Wendy says this is great, then you know, we we're we're gonna try it. And so um, you know, Faith and Luis were a hand one or two of a handful of students that had reached out to me. And I did sort of some quick video calls with the students that um, I had connected with and the ones that were most responsive and Luis and Faith just, you know, they really, they really stood out and they already felt compelling and I wanted to know more about them and more about what they were going through. And with the timing that was happening, we just had to kind of go with it. Um, and so I, uh, that's, that's really how we, we got connected with them and we just immediately started talking to them. Um, and so um, we did, like Elizabeth said, we actually did have a junior um, that we had also started with. Um, and we realized that we, after a couple weeks, that we really wanted to focus the story in on seniors and, and their experience. Um, and so that's sort of how we ended up with, with both of them. You started off by saying that um, there's something ultimately very hopeful in the way this whole story uh, unfolds. Uh, say something about Faith and Luis in terms of their hopes. And did you detect over the months that you were essentially working with them? And I'm gonna ask you afterwards to say how much fun it must have been to do all of this by remote technology when the, the normal way to do a documentary is to get up close and take pictures of people. So that's a whole other thing. But did, did you detect an arc in their, in their coping with their mounting increasingly, you know, horrendous situation and prospects? And at what point did you, what got you to say that there was something hopeful about all of this? So I think that um, these kids are remarkable. There's just no question. And 
you know, I think like for all of us, there were these moments of just, you know, really dark hours and dark days. And like I said in the beginning, I think where, especially for Luis, um, faith sometimes is a little hard to reach emotionally and physically. And we can talk a little bit also about the way that they collaborated with us on this project because it wasn't just Zoom calls. I mean, they were recording diaries for us on their phones. But I think that there was something about the reckoning, you know, in May, this incredible tragedy that, um, you know, it's not like it was one day, it's been a history in the making that I think brought this group back together and the group um, cohort and United, it's, what is it? United Minority Girls, is that right, Brooke? Yeah. Yes. Um, are really, I mean, the schools in Virginia, it's the boys group's been around for, I think it's like 20 years. It started out as this, you know, AP program um, with a lot of success for kids of color. And, you know, they had talked to us a lot about the strength of those meetings in person. We're giving them every week. Um, just, you know, the way that they could talk about things, the way they could, uh, you know, deal with issues that were really difficult in school, outside of school. And there was something about that relationship with Tim and Wendy, those two educators that we saw at the beginning, that I think when it brought them back together, I think somehow in that tragic moment of this gentleman's death and these other deaths that were happening and the protests, I think these kids, at least from where we were sitting, seemed to find something in themselves again to fight for that was beyond the pandemic. That's the way I read it. I don't know if Brooke has a different read, and I think, you know, they were really reminded of the thing that they they wanted to do with their lives, you know, which was to make the world a better place. And um, it just seemed like, you know, they were going forward in spite of all the things that were happening. They had, you know, college acceptances, et cetera. So, Brooke, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or no, clarify. No, no, that. I think the only thing that I, that I actually was thinking of while you were saying that is, when we first met Louis and Faith, and I, would, I we spoke to them, you know, in the first month or two, you know, we actually didn't realize how close of friends they were, and that was something that came up almost a few months into us filming, and that for me, there was something there that felt so inspirational in terms of how their relationship had helped them get to where they were and where they had gotten to already. Um, and I think seeing those like layers of support start to fall into place for them, especially around the reckoning with their families, with their friendship, with this cohort and UMG program that is just such an amazing program and they would not have been where they are without this program. Um, and just everything that they had already been through, we were starting to see all of that coalesce in this moment that was such an intense you know, world event that I think was just just really powerful to see that all come together. And so I think that was a moment that I think all of us were in a in a pretty pretty dark time, but also a moment where I think we sort of made this crest like, oh, okay, like this, we gotta keep following this. We have to keep seeing where these students end up and we need to see how this helps, you know, keep motivating them forward. Um, so yeah. I think one of the things that led a lot of us to uh, get to the edge of despair in the, certainly in the first months of the pandemic and then in the, in the aftermath of George Floyd and the other horrible scenes that we saw, one of the things that helped us, walked us off the ledge, let's just say, was evidence of the extent to which people such as Faith and Luis, in your case, were, were supporting each other. And that there was this kind of maybe instinctive, <clears throat> or I'm not sure where it comes from, but part of the resilience had to do with a sense of maintaining a community friendship and support. I think some of that gets a little bit lost in some of the statistics that we see about the past year. <clears throat> and I think for you, it must have also been part of the success of the film is the extent to which you and the people you were 
of filming, at least at some tacit level, were joining forces and coping with, with, with this. The building up of trust, how, how did you encounter obstacles in that? Were there anxieties that they felt about, you know, two obviously successful white women coming to film a documentary about them and their situation? Did, did you sense those issues too? Yeah, I mean, um, it's something that Elizabeth and I were really aware of and, and we talked about a lot. And I think um, the biggest thing that I think really helped, like I said earlier, I mean, one of the biggest things was having um, Tim and Wendy really vouch for us at the beginning. And I think there was already an initial layer of trust there. Luis had also seen me with my camera on his college trip in his classrooms. And so he had an awareness of this. And it's possible now that I think about it, maybe Louise had talked to Faith and said like, I, I kind of know Brooke and like, she, you know, she's been doing this thing. I don't know, I actually have never asked him that. But, um, you know, when I was thinking about this, I, you know, I think this consistency of connection was was so important. I, I spoke to Louise and Faith, I would say um, almost every week. <laughs> Um, for the six months. I mean, there were there were up and down times where we were less connected, but especially in the beginning, um, it was really important to keep deepening that connection over time. And I think we we were so privileged to have this amount of time to follow them. And I think there was a sense of not putting them in a situation, especially in the beginning, to feel like they just needed to tell all. It was really just a moment for them to tell us how they were feeling and to slowly over time learn about their story and have them feel comfortable opening up to us when they felt comfortable. Um, so, um, like you said, I think something Elizabeth and I were we talked about too is that I want to point out how unique of a situation you know this was. You know, usually we have a lot of pre-production and planning before interviews, um, and you know we have to pick a place and date and time, and we come with all our gear and we have, you know, all this stuff, and and it takes time and resources. And in this case, we dropped into um, Faith and Louise's bedroom from our from our own apartments. Um, there were no cameras. It was just Zoom. It was just iPhones. It was just us. And there was this sort of rapid intimacy in that, I think, that is just something that I have continued to process and, and continue to think about as I think about this work going forward. Um, but that in itself was, was really unique and um, challenging, but also this, like I said, this sense of intimacy that happened really quickly in a way that doesn't normally happen. And I think that also, I mean, COVID to some extent, and I'm not going to say this uniformly, but, you know, to some, in some ways it was a, an equalizer because everybody was at home. Everybody had to show where they lived, you know, unless you were going to put some zoom background on your you know, screen. But the other thing is from the beginning, when we realized, like, you know, we needed them to be a part of this. It wasn't just going to be Zoom interviews. And we made it very clear that this was a collaboration between us and them. And I do think, you know, we had to, we talked about that a lot with them. Not that they discussed it with us, but we said, you know, we, we need you. We need you to help us tell this story because we can't do it without you. And we couldn't. I mean, just to do a series of interviews would have been boring and they probably would not have said, the kinds of things to us necessarily, certainly in the beginning, that they felt more comfortable saying to their phone. That's a that what you've just described is for me one of the most fascinating, I would say, combination of technical and cultural aspects of doing this sort of work. Under normal circumstances, you you try to show something that looks spontaneous, but you plan ahead for it. So spontaneity with a lot of planning is kind of the, the normal way. Here you were thrown into really spontaneous thing with very little thing. So maybe someday we'll, we, we can talk more about what you've learned as, as documentarist, as a filmmaker, as a writer, producer, uh, about that tension between spontaneity and pre-planning. Uh, I have almost no training in this at all, but I have a feeling that some of my colleagues 
who study and who do ethnography and qualitative inquiry and that sort of essentially social science would find that aspect of what you've done here very, very compelling and very, you know, very important to to work that, that goes on in research. One of you, I think, I think, Brooke, you said that uh, essentially um, they were eager, the Faith and Louise were looking to, to the future to make the world a better place. And it, it reminded me that there is a, a bit of a debate in the in our business about whether this this pandemic and the awakening to our racial maladies um, signifies an inflection point and forces us to say we can't just go back to a status quo that was untenable. While at the same time, I see in people like Faith and Louise, they would have loved for all of this to end and return to something quote unquote normal. Do you have some insights about this tension between the, the, you know, what it means to quote unquote return to normal versus let's, let's now look ahead to a different future. What about kids like kids, young adults like Faith and Louise? who are exactly at that moment of their own personal points of inflection. Does, does any of that make sense what I'm getting at here? If I mean, I think that, um, well, first of all, I think a lot of people have talked about resilience. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to really answer your question. I'm gonna think I understand it, but um, I think these kids have a lot of drive. And I think that for us who are people who are older, where you see this as one, you know, year out of 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or whatever, it has a different experience than for somebody who's 17 or 18. It's already like, you know, I can't do the math, but it's a, a significant percentage of their lives. So, you know, I think getting back to normal for any of us is going to be a question mark. I think obviously it will impact us all in different ways. I think for young people like Luis and Faith, you know, I think to some extent it just will get integrated into their lives and change them forever. How so we don't really know and probably won't know for a while. I don't know that that answered your question, but. Um, well, yeah, know, kind of it does. It reminds me that I don't have a good way of framing the question. <laughs> I, I take whatever I can get on this, but th this tension between, you know, quote unquote normal and where are we and where are we going? Uh, I just want to suggest that people who watch this film ought to keep that in mind because I think this what we what I've learned from watching these young people and for that matter their their mentors, their teachers, Wendy and um, help me with the other gentleman's name, uh, Tim. Tim. Uh, you sense in them also this uh, abiding belief in what they have been doing for these kids, and now they confront this awful thing. We have a, an interesting question from one of um, G Shed's uh, alumni, I should say. I'm not going to name names, but the question is how you decided kind of which moments, because you must have had a lot of outtakes. And you must have done a lot of filming and your iPhones must have been busting at the seams. So I'm paraphrasing the question here. So how do you go about picking the stuff that, that stays in? To what extent does, can you, can you share some of that artistic license with us? Yeah. Um, well, I will say Elizabeth was amazing in helping me out with this because, uh, you know, we had hours and hours and hours of uh, of Zoom interviews and diaries and, um, you know, I, I had a little insight. I actually, I had a shared album with Luis where he would, and Faith, where they would upload their photos and videos and their diaries into it in our iPhone. And so I would just constantly <laughs> be getting these, these diaries and these videos every week. Um, and I was, I was really, I was really in it. I was like in their world and I was hearing their day-to-day -day details, their ups and downs. And I think me being so emotionally invested in that and having Elizabeth being a little bit in, 
in this sort of broader picture um, and not being in the day-to-day -day as much was actually incredibly valuable in terms of collaboration and making this these really hard decisions. Um, so I would say we, and Elizabeth, you can follow up on this, but I would say that we, uh, we basically just kept filming. <laughs> we just kept filming, we kept getting stuff up until uh, September, and then we sort of finished with them on campus. Um, but once September came around, we were both sitting there with all of this stuff, and we had to figure out how to shape this story. Um, and it was really hard. It was really hard. Um, we had lots of different ideas around how to do that. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to the editing, right? I mean, you, we have transcriptions and we are going through the transcriptions and we're going through all of the clips and thinking about the broader picture and the context of the story within this year. Um, and so I leaned on Elizabeth a lot as I was editing it to watch these, to share this sort of collaborative editing and have her watch these scenes that I had put together and having her say like, this is something that we have to say goodbye to. Um, so Elizabeth, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, well, I'm gonna pay you a huge compliment, which is that, you know, Brooke is extremely well organized. And so, which really helps for something like this. And I will say that um, I'm kind of from the old school documentary film world, which is where I was, you know, professionally raised. And, you know, where you have, I used to be an editor, film editor, and it's like, you are so deep into things. I was reading recently Walter Murch's book on, um, on editing, which my husband handed to me a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, you sort of lose yourself. I mean, I, I think, yeah, Brooks and nodding her head, like you lose yourself as you're looking at the footage, because at some point, you know, you have your first reaction and then you're like, I can't tell what I feel anymore. So it does really help to have somebody that's not as much connected to it emotionally that can come in and sort of make those hard calls. But I would say, you know, if you're not organized, it's impossible because then you just end up with, you know, you just sort of don't even know where you're going. And I will also say that, you know, even as we didn't really know where we were going, we sort of knew where we were going. It's like, there was this story, I will say, because of the circumstances that everybody was at home. And, you know, we had originally said, oh, we're gonna do an eight minute film. I was just like, let's just see what happens. Let's just let it go and see what happens and we'll figure it out as we go. And that's what we did. I'm just gonna put my uh, kind of researchers hat on for a moment here and press on this just one, one more inch with you. Um, I think one of the things that I love the most about the whole film is that I didn't detect in it that you went into it with uh, a position, a point of view that you were going to try to, you know, make the case. <clears throat> uh, now, I think we all go into everything we do with a certain amount of, you know, priors and whatnot. But here, I, I, I sense that there was a huge amount of discovery taking place at, and much less, uh, shall we say, advocacy of prior views about this. And I don't know if I'm, if I'm right about that, uh, but I think that's something very special about, about the, the film, at least for me. And I think there are lessons in there about how one approaches any kind of really complicated topic, whether you're doing it with film or collecting data or something, to allow enough space for discovery and to not let discovery be displaced by whatever you know position we may have wanted to uh, get across. I, I, have you guys thought about that or is this just a natural thing? No, I know I mean, I think about that because she gets tons of of submissions of people who are claiming to be completely objective and all they want to do is discover something. And of course they all have their, their very well articulated point of view along the way. I mean, I think, yeah. And usually I'm telling them what side of the issue are you on? I think in this case, like I originally with the, the project that I was planning to do, it was very much going to be told from the counselor's point of view and from diaries like that they would keep on their um, phones. I will also say that 
um, I don't, you know, I don't think we're the first people to do this, but Adrian Nicole LeBlanc is somebody who wrote this book called Random Family, and I will never forget her story. It's an amazing book where she covered these kids for 12 years in um, the South Bronx in New York City. And one thing that she, I mean, she spent 12 years on the book. And one thing she did, she got so sick of reporting on the kids that she basically gave them the tape recorders and said, just talk into the tape recorders and I'll pick them up or however they worked it out, you know, once a week or once a month. So, I mean, you know, I'm sure there are other things I've seen where they've done this, but I sort of stole that idea when I was thinking about this other project and then it seemed to apply it in this one. Brooke, did you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I would just build upon the fact that I think we had to let go of so much control for this. And in, in, in any sort of documentary film or story, you're, you are in a way, you know, letting sort of a greater power be and, and just sort of see what happens. But in this particular film, I mean, we really just let things unfold. Um, and there was so much power in that. I think there was so much power in the limitations that we had actually. Yeah. And also in empowering Luis and Faith, who, you know, um, Luis was definitely way more comfortable with using his phone and his diaries. He's on social media more. Faith was not, is not that kind of teenager. She's not on social media. She uses Snapchat, I think, like a little bit, but like otherwise, you know, her, it wasn't a family value or a family tra tradition of theirs to document. And so she wasn't, that wasn't something that she was used to. And so it, it was also sort of this evolution of seeing her um, feel more empowered to feel like her voice mattered enough and her experience mattered enough that people wanted to hear it and wanted to listen. And um, it definitely took work with her to do that. And I think just letting them use this phone and this tool and give them space. The space was really important to just give them space to be able to say how they felt um, and let them tell their story through their own words and their eyes was, was yeah, I mean, was really valuable and really effective and, and really impactful for, for what um, the final film was. So since you used the word empower, it's a perfect segue to a question that we got from one of our guests. Uh, I'm just going to read the question and you'll see why I think this is really very important. To what extent did Louise and Faith contribute to and or prove the final product? I'm curious about voice, narrative, and who gets to structure the quote unquote final story being told. What does it mean for seemingly white identified cisgender women to be the lead architects? That's a great question. Um, right. So I think, I mean, I've, I've made documentaries in my previous career um, about other communities than, you know, white cisgender community that I am a member of. Um, I think that when you're doing any kind of journalism, you have to retain control over the story in the sense that once you, I mean, you can involve people to the extent that we did, but if you turn over the narrative to somebody else, then it becomes something else. And I think we made, we, we had that call very early on. We did have a moment where Luis's parents were concerned and, um, I don't know. Do you want to talk about that, Brooke, at all? Or do you um, want me to finish? Yeah, you can finish, finish it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, there was a concern, and we've had that. I've had this before. I mean, I did a, a film a year ago about a Pueblo community in New Mexico where there was a lot of concern about, you know, what is this thing that you're going to produce before, you know, can we see it before it gets out? In that case, it was no. In this case, it was no. But Luisa's parents were very concerned because they wanted to make sure that, um, you know, we weren't violating his privacy. I think Faith's family, her father, as you know, lives in the continent of Africa. Her mother has got a job where she's working all the time. That wasn't as much of an issue. So what we did do with Luisa's parents is we actually read some of the sections that they expressed concern about to them. And in one instance, they were like, oh, Luis has, Luis has this story all wrong, which was helpful because then we could correct it. But um, 
I don't know. I mean, I guess in my career doing video, I feel comfortable with the reception of the things that I've done to and the ability to kind of step aside um, to feel okay about doing something like this. I mean, I we we kind of turned the camera over to them. It was our choice what we included, but you know, we wanted them to come off as who they are and not to tell some other I don't know. I don't know what other kind of story. I'm sure I didn't fully answer the question to the person's satisfaction, but I don't know, Brooke, do you want to? And we did think about it. We you know we did think about it. I mean, I'm also a white person who was editing a lot of pieces about the reckoning by people of color in May. I mean, it was important for me to get that voice out there. It's the same thing here. It was just an opportunity that arose. We were like, we're just going to take it. So, Brooke, do you want to add anything? No, I mean, I think I think you you hit on some of the points I was thinking about. I think um, you, you know when we could have an entire we could have a four hour symposium on on power and journalism and documentary. I, I don't want to get into it too much, but I think um, yeah, inherently we had the final decisions, and and that's how it is um, in journalism and in documentary. But I think why I do this work and I think why Elizabeth does this work is to be able to find those voices that we want to elevate. Um, and in this case, Luis and Faith's voice were um, the driving force of this film. And, um, you know, we we had formed these relationships over time where they did, they did come to trust us. And I think um, we were constantly checking in with them. I mean, not in terms of determining what we were going to have in this film, but there was a constant back and forth of how are you feeling about this? Are you feeling comfortable? Do you need help in terms of filming? You know, what are questions that you have about this? Do you need it? You know, there was there was a lot of a lot of checking in on their well being and how they felt being a part of this and what it meant to be a part of this. We were constantly having those conversations with them. And yes, ultimately, you know, when you see yourself in a in a documentary, you're not really going to know until you see it. And I think to be totally honest, like that is something that um, um, can be really nerve wracking as a filmmaker. You know, I think you're putting someone else's story out there and you really want to do it justice. And I really, really, we both really wanted to do Luis and Faith's story and Tim and Wendy um, justice. And, and, you know, we did our best to do that and to collaborate with them to, to do that. I mean, the only other thing, I just, the only quick other thing I'll add is that we made it clear that we could not tell the story without them. We needed them to tell the story. We were very clear that you are the voice, you know, of your like cohort, literally and figuratively at school and around the country. And we want to know, you know, what this is like. You're helping us tell this, you know, to other people. Um, so, yeah. It's, um, I, I put that down on the list for the syllabus that we're going to develop for what Brooke offered the four hour version of this symposium <laughs> is to get into these issues of how does a, in this case, filmmaker, documentary maker, uh, take advantage of the instincts of empathy that you develop for your subjects. And at the same time, <clears throat> wanting to exercise some, some form of curatorial discretion, quality control, independence, and ultimate decision making. Don't try to answer that now, but it, 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 it's, I think, one of the aspects of this. And I can tell from some of the questions that have come in that that's, that's maybe part of the technical side of this. I mean, you both came to this with a lot of knowledge about the world of schools and schooling and, and kids and education and you know, career paths and college going and all of that, but you also had to had to apply some very specific kind of quote unquote technical knowledge and experience to manage that kind of, um, you know, to walk that bridge between being with your subjects and also having the ultimate decision about what's what's in and what's not. One of the questions that came in is on a, on, a, on a related technical thing. You did all of this using remote technology. So we mentioned that earlier. 
you want to give us a little bit of a one two on that i feel a little bit like you know when i go to a magic show i run up to the magician at the end and i say ooh, ooh, how'd you do that so tell us how you did it oh man there are so many so many different <laughs> virtual um you know i mean in the beginning a lot of it was getting to know them and 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 i think um we were we were so concerned about just just getting them to tell us how, what they were experiencing in the moment of so much chaos um and so we were recording zoom interviews um that was sort of the 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 biggest technical thing in the beginning um with various uh internet connectivities you can see that Luis's is a little bit less strong than faith's and a lot of them um but at the same time you know it was was really reflective of what we were all experiencing right this like visual intensity and chaos of these multiple different virtual environments that we were all being thrown into and we actually really wanted to amp that up and reflect that um and so there was that there was faith and louise using their um you know their their iphones for a lot of their recording and then um you know throughout parts of the film you'll see that i was filming them um you know earlier in the fall um and then again on campus and that was using you know my cinema camera that i that i would use and um you know and throughout this too like the cohort team switched to from zoom to microsoft teams and so we had to figure out how to record that um and that was like there had some challenges and then one of the things that we ended up actually doing in November, um, I think it was in November when we went to see when we went to film faith on campus, we still were restricted on our travel and so I was able to go and film um, Luis at BCU I was able to drive there from DC, but I couldn't get to St. Louis in time and I couldn't fly. And so I ended up hiring um, a cinematographer there, um, a, a woman. Um, Faith had requested that there that it be a woman. Um, and we um, we set up a virtual interview there where I was on a laptop from DC um, while the cinematographer was filming the interview. And Faith was talking to me on the laptop while it was being filmed. Um, so I think that made a huge difference in, in her comfort level in that interview. Um, you know, just knowing me over the last nine months versus someone who was new. We also had, we had lots of introductory calls with the cinematographer and we, we really, uh, I was really, really bummed that I couldn't be there. And so we did everything we could to, to make that feel like I was. Um, and yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing thinking about the future of documentary film and, and how some of these remote situations are going to be utilized. Um, yeah, and then Elizabeth and I collaborated in terms of editing where I was like sharing my, you know, I use I use Adobe Premiere for editing and we were I was sharing Premiere uh, on her iPad while, you know, I was playing it and she was telling me to cut things through the iPad. It was yeah, I don't know, Elizabeth, I think you got a really big kick out of that. So we wanted to talk about that part. No, it was just it was actually great. It was it was just perfect. I mean, we would have been together in one room, but this allowed us to like collaborate exactly as we would if we were in person. It was it was great. Uh, I think we're getting close to time, but I do want to ask one one and a half more questions. Um, first, have you been able to stay in touch with Faith and Louise? And what's cooking with them if you have? Tell us something that will keep us even more hopeful now than when we started all this conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's been some challenges. I have I have kept in touch with Luis and Faith, and um, I, I did learn uh, that Faith actually, um, her mother had a pretty intense scare with COVID um, in December and was on a ventilator for about two weeks and was you know it was um a really intense time for faith she was at school while this was happening had to go home and stay with her friend um while her mom was in the hospital and they were really scared that she wasn't going to make it she her mom has diabetes um and so it was um she was in intensive care for for that amount of time and and she amazingly pulled through 
And this was also when Faith had to take her finals at home. <laughs> and her sister, her sister Stephanie, was um, was at home by herself while her mom was in the hospital and having to deal with this all on her own. And it, it was a really, really difficult time for her family. I will say um, one of the most hopeful things that came out of that recently was that her sister Stephanie, which makes an appearance in the film, you see her, she actually filmed Faith sometimes in the film. Um, she was behind the iPhone sometimes. Um, she found out that she got a full ride to the University of Chicago. And so that was sort of this incredible moment. You know, Faith was telling me she was in the middle of her cafeteria while she was sort of like screaming, falling to the ground, crying. I think it was this incredible release for her um, and her family after what they had been through. And she said her mom is about 80% better. Um, and she's getting there and so it was pretty scary um but also they're just they're really really excited about stephanie and and um her future and it's also kind of close to st louis so faith is excited that you know she can maybe see her sister in chicago so luis is doing okay um he has a lot of his uh, both of them have a big course load and so they're definitely struggling with remote learning as they transition and still their you know their first year of college um, I would say the biggest concern for Luis right now still is he doesn't know how he's going to pay for next year. He won't find out about scholarships till the summer. He hasn't gotten his financial aid package yet, and he's actually going to move off campus with friends because it's cheaper to live off campus. But I will also say that he has bloomed uh, in terms of he's socially, he's been, um, He's been having a great time, even with social distancing and everything that's going on. He's made a lot of friends and um, he did pledge into a fraternity, uh, which has been which has been um, something that he uh, is, is looking forward to. Um, so, yeah, they're they're facing there. There's still a lot of challenges um, that they're facing. But I think as the film shows, they're amazing and resilient students. And I think um, I think they're they're going to be okay. They're they're still just really excited for the warmer weather, um, and being able to um, to feel a little bit more normal in in the months to come and and in next year. So I think that keeps them going a lot. Thank you both so much. I, I hope uh, that if you continue to and I, I'm confident you will have continuing uh, ties with Faith and Louise when you do. Uh, thank them from me, at least, and I think from everybody who sees this, for letting us uh, get, be part of part of a small part of their lives. Uh, it's it's a real gift that you've given us uh, to be able to have this. And you answered my second question, which is, do you come away from all of this more hopeful or less hopeful? I think I'm sensing more hopeful. And what you've done is given me great hope that this continued sort of um, concern, empathy, and caring for situations like this and learning from them is uh, the best way forward and maybe our only great hope. So thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Michael, yeah, and everybody for coming. What a treat. Thank you to the great G Shed uh, production crew known as Mikulaski, Holland and Waters uh, for yet another uh, perfect uh, WebEx uh, event. And thank you to all of our colleagues in GW and outside who joined us. And um, uh, I'm anticipating that you will get a lot of prizes and awards for this. And I hope that I don't have to do it remotely, but I'll be cheering no matter which way it happens. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for having us. It's a great pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.